now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. In May, Pope Francis set tongues a-wagging when in a homily during his morning mass, he referenced a visit from extraterrestrials. The media ran with it and suggested that the Catholic Church was confirming the existence of intelligent life on other planets. It wasn't exactly what the Pope was trying to say, but it did create an interesting opportunity to discuss the relationship between faith and science. Are the two in opposition? Joining us tonight is a man who has literally pondered the mysteries of the heavens as part of his job. He is an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory and the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, a Jesuit and the co-author of the new book, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? We're delighted to have joining us Brother Guy Consolmagno in studio. Great, great to see you, brother. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I want to start with this notion that people have, mm -hmm. that there's a conflict between faith and science. You don't see it that Well, way. of course not. I mean, here I am, I've got a collar yeah. and, and an MIT ring, now, which right. proves you <laughs> can that. be, at the same time, a fanatic and a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am. I'm, I'm something of a nerd about my religion, but I'm a fanatic about my science. Mm. And what people have to remember is that science came from the church. Yep. It was invented in the medieval universities. Mm -hmm. Even the Galileo affair that everyone wants to throw at us right. because they don't have anything else to throw at <laughs> us, which tells you something there. Yeah. Why was the church interested? Because it was interested in science, because it's interested in the physical universe, mm -hmm. because it's interested in creation as an expression of the creator. Hmm. I love that. Uh, and we're going to get into the book, which really is a back and forth with you and your co-author, a Jesuit mm -hmm. priest, uh, uh, and a colleague at the right, observatory. Right. Paul Muller, yeah. yeah. And it, it, is, it is really grappling with the big questions that people have. Yes. And along the way, though, it's really a philosophical, artistic, um, educational tour and a scientific exploration as well. You've kind of woven all of that in, in a beautiful package. Well, the one thing you... Oh, Hope you also got yeah. was a good laugh out of it. Oh yeah, no, it's it's, it's lighthearted. It's very lighthearted. If it's not fun, why don't we? Do, you know, why what's do you want to do that? It? Exactly. Now, let's back up a little bit before sure. I get into some of these big questions you, you grapple with. Mm -hmm. How did you come to this profession, and where did your interest in science begin? Well, I'm a baby boom kid. Uh -huh. and a Sputnik kid. You know, I started kindergarten uh -huh. when Sputnik went up. I finished high school at UAD High when people landed on the moon, and when I decided not to become a Jesuit my freshman year at BC, mm. which is another long story in itself, um, I discovered that MIT, where my best friend was going, yeah. had the world's biggest collection of science fiction. Oh. So I transferred there only to read science fiction, by accident got into the Earth and Planetary Science Department, discovered there are rocks that fall from the asteroid belt called mm. meteorites. You can touch outer space. What could be more thrilling? Wow, what did you read? Um, Trash, wonderful <laughs> trash, space opera, you know. Yeah, uh, I love it. And and I still to this day enjoy reading wonderful adventure stories that remind you that this universe is something that we live in. Mm. It's not just things we ponder about, but planets are places where people have adventures. I love that. I love that. Um, the book starts. The first one of the first questions you all wrestle with is the whole question pitting the Big Bang mm -hmm. against. The book of Genesis. Right. They are in absolute conflict. <laughs> Many say you can you have to either right. side with one or side with the other, and science disproves the book of Genesis. You would say what? Well, first of all, the book of Genesis is not a science book because science books weren't invented when yeah. the book of Genesis was written. But not only that, I've got two really thick books in my desk. Mm -hmm. One is the Bible. One is Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler's treatise on general relativity called gravitation. Mm -hmm. Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler's book is 30 years old and it's out of date. Huh. Science books go out of date. They're supposed to go out of date. Books of theology, books of philosophy, Shakespeare, yeah. Plato, those books don't go out of date. Mm -hmm. The Bible does not go out of date because it's not a science book. It's a book about God. And you can find three different stories of creation in the Bible all of them have one thing in common. No matter how you think the world was made, God did it deliberately out of love. Mm. And that's the message that Genesis gives us. Huh. You know, Genesis tells me who's responsible for the universe. My science tells me how he did it. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's not an either or proposition as well, we often hear. Not only that. It's got to be Big Bang or it's got to be the Lord going and the wind. Right. But more than that, 
both of those things misunderstand what religion is and what science is. Science is not a big book of facts. Religion is not a big book of rules. Religion is something that you live. Science is, is a conversation we have about the facts, and, and we're never convinced we've got all the facts, otherwise I'd be out of a job as a scientist. <laughs> we don't want that to no. happen. Uh, t tell me a moment, you are an astronomer, mm -hmm. and probably, I guess the biggest star of all time right. is the star Bethlehem. Right. Uh, is there any evidence to prove or disprove, uh, astronomy-wise, mm -hmm. that there was a Bethlehem star? What might this have been? Oh, well that's the embarrassing thing. There are so many candidates. Mm. Um, you can go onto Amazon, type in, you know, Star of Bethlehem, you'll get 400 different books. Mm. Everyone giving you a different story about this one's right and obviously all the other guys are wrong. There are some that I think are fairly convincing and others that are um, maybe not. Uh -huh. The bigger question is why do you care so much? Mm. Why is it so important? What is at stake in there being a Star of Bethlehem? Mm. And that's what we try to get at in the book is really what's motivating you to worry about this? The real question is, does God act in the universe? Does God do things like make stars? Does God do things like have miracles? And what is it to be a miracle? Nowadays we think of miracles like the star might have been yeah. as, as God violating the laws of nature, but that's not what a miracle is because there were miracles before we had laws of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, a, as a scientist, particularly as one who gazes up and mm -hmm. watches this new phenomena, seeing things that frankly many of our eyes will sure. never see, has it caused doubt to creep into your faith <sighs> or has it expanded your faith? <laughs> How could it cause doubt? Yeah. Truth does not contradict truth. Mm. Uh, St. John Paul II said that. Mm. And he's quoting a long line of theological argument going back to Thomas Aquinas and before then. Anything that we learn in the universe that's true brings us closer to God. Mm. But here's what I've learned personally as an astronomer, that the universe is logical. It didn't have to be logical. It could have been chaos, but it isn't. Yeah, it's designed. The universe has rules that it follows. It didn't have to be that way. The pagans all thought that, you know, lightning happened because the God of lightning threw things, and if it's just the gods doing stuff, then there's no logic. It would be impossible to do science. Mm -hmm. But Christianity says, no, God does things in an orderly way, in a logical way. Mm -hmm. He obeys his own laws. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the amazing thing. Of all of that, I could say the universe is logical. The universe has laws. Mm -hmm. But what I would never have expected is that it's so beautiful. Huh. At the end of the day, it's not only logical, but when you see a sunset, it gives you joy. Mm -hmm. And when you understand Maxwell's equations that explain the colors, mm -hmm. that gives you joy. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it deepens. It deepens the wonder and the, and the awesomeness of, of the Creator. Of the Creator. It's, it's a way that we have of playing with God. It's how mm -hmm. God can interact with us because He wants us to love Him with our hearts, but also our minds and also our souls. I need to share something with you. I, I teased it at the beginning of the segment. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis, during right. one of his morning homilies, had this to say. I'll share it with the audience. He said, imagine if, for example, tomorrow an expedition of Martians came, green with long noses and big ears, just like children draw them, and were to say, I want to be baptized, what would happen? Now, the media went crazy <laughs> when he said uh -huh. this. What was he trying to say? And then I'll pop yeah. the big question Okay. To you. Well, of course, he was really talking about that scene in uh, the early church where they're trying to decide whether or not to let Gentiles in. Mm. And for them to accept Gentiles into their religion was as strange and as frightening to them as having Martians would be for us today. That was the point he was trying to make, yeah. and, and a wonderfully creative point. Now, now here's the big question. Yeah. Would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Only if she asks. Okay. <laughs> well, so, so I, you're going to call me when this happens because yeah, I'd like to, yeah, yeah. like to be there at the font where it, you do it's, it. It's fascinating. We get emails all the time. I got one just this past week. Well, the Pope has to say that it's like he has to, you know. People are convinced not only that there's extraterrestrials, but by golly, they're just like what they read about in the papers or they're just like what they had a dream about last night. E.T. We don't know of any extraterrestrials. We don't even know of microbial life yet elsewhere. Do I think it's out there? Probably, but I don't have the data. Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. the physicist, who yeah. is a member of the Pontifical Academy of Science, mm -hmm. 
said because of the laws of physics, mm -hmm. it has removed the need for God. First uh, of all, what did he mean by that, mm -hmm. and does he have a point? He has a point in that if you think God is, by definition, what started the universe, mm -hmm. and then you say, well, actually, what started the Big Bang was a fluctuation in the gravity field, mm -hmm. all you're doing is you're proving that, well, God must be gravity, which mm -hmm. might explain why Catholics, you know, celebrate Mass, <laughs> but that's not what we think God is. Mm -hmm. That's not the Christian idea of creating out of nothing. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember, as a kid, the game Mousetrap? Sure. You know, there's this really yep. complicated thing, and you, you crank like it up. a little roller coaster, right. and you drop and then, the... And then you start one thing off, and it goes... Blah, 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 blah. Right. And they think that God is the person who starts the thing off. But no. God's the guy who invented the game mm. back at the Ideal Toy Company five yeah. years earlier. <laughs> if you reduce God to just the, another force in, along with gravity or electricity, mm -hmm. you're turning God into a nature God. You're turning God into the God of lightning again. You're reducing God to nothing more than, than Zeus. Mm. But God is not a nature God. God is supernatural. When God supports the universe at every instant, because God is outside of time, mm -hmm. God allows there to be laws of nature. God allows there to be gravity. God allows there to be a universe. Mm. And then, as He creates us, He gives us the freedom to love him in return. Talk for a moment, I'm getting a few emails about this, about the creative design mm -hmm. movement, yeah. um, which was kind of formulated in mm -hmm. reaction to evolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How is the Catholic to look at both of these, and as a scientist and a man of faith, you would yeah. say what? Well, God is not something you come to at the end of a long line of logical proofs. Nobody has ever been convinced by a syllogism. Nobody's ever been converted by a syllogism. God is what we start with. If I believe in God and I believe in the Creator, then I can see evidence of His work throughout mm -hmm. the universe. If I believe that the universe is nothing but mechanism, I'll see evidence of nothing but mechanism because I'm just returning back to the very thing I assumed in the first mm -hmm. place. The thing that worries me when people try to use science to prove God is that they're making science bigger than God as a result. Mm. I'm a scientist. I love science, yeah. but I don't want it to be someplace where it doesn't belong. Has it deepened your faith, science, the exposure to science? Science deepens my faith, but it's really the other way around. Faith is what it makes it possible for me to do science. Huh. Faith is what makes me want to do science. You'll find a terrible thing happens when scientists are out there and they've lost the faith in truth that they've lost the faith. You know, Stephen Hawking thinks that yeah. God was the, the, the force that started things, yeah. but Stephen Hawking is dedicated to truth. But mm. God is truth. Mm. If you're worshiping truth, you're worshiping God. Mm. They sometimes, when, when an atheist tells me they don't believe in God, I ask them, well, what's the God you, you know, there are a lot of versions of God, I don't believe it. Yeah. I only believe in one God. Mm. Yeah, and, and many times they believe in multiples. So, yeah, yeah. Brother Guy, thank you so much for being here. It's a fascinating book. Would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Questions from the astronomer's inbox at the Vatican Observatory. Before I let you go very yes, quickly, right. tell us about the Vatican Observatory. It's uh, there at Costal Gandolfo. You've got one in the backyard, right, you know, the, right. the, in the Vatican Gardens, well, and here in Arizona. Yeah, I mean, the church literally supports astronomy. The telescopes are on the roof of the Pope's summer home. Huh. Uh, we have a dozen astronomers from five continents. Um, we speak eight languages, and that's just one of our guys. Uh, we cover every kind of astronomy. We work with the regular astronomers. We collaborate with astronomers around the world. We've even been elected to astronomers' positions in the International Astronomical Union. It's amazing. We were involved in demoting Pluto, I'm afraid. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry for poor Pluto, but there's always Donald Duck and Mickey. That's um, it. You can visit the Vatican Observatory online at vofoundation.org. It's a fascinating uh, gift, really, to the whole church. Thank you.